the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone. I started my closing credits before I even began today, so it's just a crazy moment right now. But both of our guests are waiting in the wings. I'm thrilled that you're all here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you all for waiting. We are continuing our celebration of Jerry Torrey and all and the Marble Fawn, of course, and all things Grey Gardens. Uh, those of you who follow the show and have been following this series, this began when Tony Maeda, uh was suggested to me by Del Shores uh, for both uh, Tony and for Jerry to come on the show to talk about their incredible book, all about the life of the Marble Fawn, Jerry Torrey. Uh, he came on the show. That went so well that Glenn Rosenblum got in touch with me about doing a show celebrating the cast of the upcoming production of Grey Gardens, One Night Only, that's being done in Los Angeles uh, with Musical Theater Guild. That went well, but unfortunately, one of our actors was unable to join us that night. But he's here today, and that's Zachary Ford, who is playing Jerry on stage. Uh, Zachary, before we delve into everything, uh, welcome to the show, first of all. Thank you very much. I always begin uh, these shows uh, because it's Richard Skipper Celebrates, who or what are you celebrating today? Oh, um, uh, I, I, I guess uh, uh, that I have some theater to do upcoming. Uh, it, it's uh, I'm, it's been such a strange uh, shift throughout the pandemic, and I'm I'm looking forward to getting to be uh, on stage for a bit. Well, thank God for that. Yeah. Uh, what was happening when the pandemic hit? Were you in the midst of a production, or were you? looking for work as all of us do in this business or, you know, what was happening? Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, actually just moved to Kansas City with my family. Um, and we arrived here uh, March 1st, uh, March 10th, and then, uh, and then the world shut down. So uh, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a strange what time to, you go to Kansas? feel. Uh, uh, sorry, what was that? I said, see what happens when you go to Kansas? I know, it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got whipped into the the cyclone. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um. So, as an actor, um, do you get a lot of opportunities in Kansas, or do you travel between the two coasts? Uh, it's been a. It, it is. Uh, this is. It, it's a. It's a strange thing because I feel like the the pressure to say like, no, I've been working constantly here in Kansas City and the Missouri area. But honestly, I've I've stepped back from the industry a little bit. This the last. Uh, couple of years here um, to, to spend more time with family um, and to kind of refocus on on that. But uh, but that is part of the reason that I'm so looking forward to getting back to L.A. to do this uh, this uh, uh, concert event, this this stage reading event of Great Gardens with uh, Musical Theater Guild is because I one of the things I miss most about being out there is this uh, this company and these these opportunities to get um, to do shows that not everybody else gets an opportunity to do. Um, so I, I made it back for this. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. How did you first get involved with Musical Theater Guild? I got pulled in because they were looking for uh, some some people. Uh, I know I don't look like it right right now with my uh, it, with my current wardrobe, but I got pulled in because they needed some people who could. Um, rock out with some some uh, ridiculousness and some high stuff on high fidelity uh maybe almost 15 years ago now wow. Wow. and i'd i just auditioned audition for the musical director on something else and he was like we need to see this guy at least and uh it was a it was a great opportunity um th it's a terrific group of people and they're all doing this because they love it um which is which is great. Uh, it's it's fun to get to do some of the outreach with the kids uh, in the uh, the schools. It's fun to um, kind of uh, get to keep alive uh, some shows that people otherwise wouldn't get to see and hear, and and then some some ones that just need to be seen and heard more often, like uh, like Great Gardens. So. That's great. I want to ask how 
much. I mean, it's like being shot out of a cannon because you're doing this for one night only. It's a lot of work. Um, how deep or how much was Grey Gardens on your radar prior to your being cast in this? Uh, I I knew of it. I knew this some of the some of the lore around uh, around the story, and um, I it had been on my radar. Uh, uh, I. I'm a fan of Matt Cavanaugh, and I, I uh, was doing. Uh, I tried to, um, you know, uh, follow along with his career and, and see what he was doing, and and then look for those <laughs> roles to go regional. I tried to get him on the show today. I was going to surprise both of you with him. Oh, uh, but unfortunately, I was not able to connect with him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another person who's kind of relocated in the last couple of years here, um, but uh, uh, be. Because of that, it was it was on my radar. Um, I like to sing some of the things that he's gotten an opportunity to uh, to, to be, debut. So, so how much time do you have uh, between uh, finding out that you're getting cast? I know that the rehearsal period. Uh, have you even started that yet? Because that's going to be coming up in just a couple of weeks. No, my first rehearsal. I'll have a, a couple remote um, music rehearsals with the musical di director Anthony. And then, uh, and then my first rehearsal will be Friday afternoon before we perform Monday evening. Wow. So. Uh, how much have you delved into the character so far? Uh, I, I honestly, most of my homework is upcoming still, uh, to, to be completely honest. So mm -hmm. I'm, there, there'll be a lot of me finding out all sorts of things that I didn't know I even needed to ask about yet today. So I'm 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 looking forward to that, and I wish I could have come more prepared for it. It's just uh, the way life is balancing right now today. Well, those things happen. But today yeah. you're going to get an opportunity that a lot of actors never get, uh, because I'm bringing you and Jerry together uh, so that you can ask any questions that you may have uh, on his life, his career, and everything. We've had the great fortune of having him on the show twice before this. I mean, all of a sudden he's in my life, and I feel. Uh, personally, I hope he feels the same way, uh, like I have this great new friend of my life. Uh, but what I want to do is I'm going to show a little blurb. Uh, it's very uh, quick, uh, so don't go too far. Uh, that, uh, let's see, uh, that was put together for me uh, by Glenn, and then we'll uh, meet uh, Jerry on the other side. Here he is. In a statement released today, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis confirmed that her 80-year-old aunt, Miss. I told you it was fast. <laughs> it was. It was. Well, Jerry, meet oh, Zachary Ford oh, and vice versa. There you go. Zach. Jerry, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. Oh, gee. Thank you, Zach, for being here. Uh, I'm glad to help, and you look terrific. Praise. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Richard. He's a he's a star. I like him so much. <laughs> well, we're all very close now. It's I want to put, I want to put it out there. Oh. Uh, this is the book, the Marble Fawn of Great Gardens and Zachary. I hope that this is part of your pl uh, training on this. It absolutely uh, is. I'm I'm already a, a Jerry fan, and uh, uh, I'm a Del Shores fan, so I I look forward to uh, to to picking this up. Well, Tony Maeda, you know, work with Jerry, you know, and go back and look at the other two shows that we've done to talk about getting to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you have uh, any particular questions that you would like to ask Jerry as we start? Uh, J Jerry, is there, do you have a, a favorite story that you like? I, I'm sure, you know, this is the, the third time that um, Richard just had you on, so I, I may... J I, I, I hope I'm not asking you to do something redundant here. We've got new people watching, Zachary, so let's go for it. <laughs> Great. Oh, no. Wonderful. Zachary, feel free. I am your friend, and you can speak to me. Um, my favorite story about Mrs. Beale and Edie? Gee, um, well, the most tender moment, one of them, was a winter day, and Mrs. Beale, like, well, I was living in the library. I slept on an army cot. It was frigid. I woke up early that morning because I couldn't sleep. So I went upstairs, knocked on the door to Mrs. Beale's room. We called it the center bedroom. 
And uh, I stepped inside and we started talking about the day. And it eventually warmed up. We had a little space heater in that room. But eventually, Mrs. Beale asked me to go down to the library to collect uh, some LP rec, you know, LP records. <laughs> you know what they are. If you, if you don't know, then I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he does it. We're stopping the show. <laughs> no. <laughs> and he did. I went downstairs and collected several albums. Um, and they were dusty from the, but they were protected because of the cardboard cover. I brought them upstairs. The winter was slamming into the mansion, and it was frozen. The house was cold. Anyway, that day went into evening, and then, of course, it became night. And I will never, ever be able to explain this, but it's, I will thoroughly now for you. The diamond-shaped windows downstairs were covered with frost. That was even just downstairs. I went into Mrs. Beale's room and set up the Panasonic record player and began to dust off the actual LP now and place it on this pl the player, record player. And a tune began to sound. And I was sitting on my iron, I had an iron lawn chair folding. I'd sit my hands under my laps. Mind you, Zachary, I was 17 years old. And it means the world to me that you're performing for Mrs. Beale and Edie. And thank you. I don't know why how you can handle working for me or being portraying me. That's a, that's what tumbles out of my mind. Well, I hear anyway. Thanks. So here we go. I'm hear, hearing the music of this playing music of this recording. And Edie and Mrs. Beale, it is mind blowing. And all of the storm raging, no less in the corridor right outside the bedroom door, Mrs. Bill and Edie are singing in harmony, like one of the best songs ever that they sung together. They actually got the lyrics and everything right. But I stood, sat there looking, and I'm, being, I'm very clear about this. I, I started to tear up and cry because I didn't want, well, I didn't let Mrs. Beale see me crying or Edie. So I put my hand, head lowered my head, and looking at my knees. They were singing beautifully. And I then, Zach, it was then I really understood the entire history and the reasoning for their isolation. It was then that I saw their love for each other and their love for music and how devoted they were to one, each other, and to their art, the arts of music, the art of music. That was one of the most tender moments of my life. And I really made sense. I grew up a lot in, in Grey Gardens as a gentleman, young man. That was one of the, I could tell you dozens of stories. Um, so I'm gonna listen to you now. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you, Jerry, um, it, yeah. it's a moment, we'll go to you in a moment, Zachary, but I want to ask Jerry, um, obviously we are getting a microcosm of their lives uh, in this, it, let's go back to the original uh, Maisel Brothers documentary. Um, we only see a glimpse of them. And then, of course, it's been made into this great musical, and it's also been made into another movie with Jessica Lange and Drew Barrymore. What do you feel looking at both of these and looking at the musical as well, that they absolutely got right about not only their relationship, but your relationship with them. And what do you feel that we as the general public are missing in terms of your relationship with the Beals? As far as I'm concerned, the film is only 90 minutes and people only see 90 minutes of oddity and entertainment and Edie being Edie, which she was like that most of the time, and Mrs. Beale completely confident and secure about being filmed. Um, what, I, what I do know is that people are quick to criticize. They were then and they have been recently. They can, honestly, they can be very cruel. And what freaks me out is that they don't understand the details that led to such a tragedy in living inside that mansion. So I have to often, like, 
unplug to, to understand my feelings and not get loud and want to yell at them or something. So I'd rather not do that. I did not do that only but once when the fire department and the Board of Health showed upstairs that day when the raid was beginning. Mm -hmm. That was the worst day. For, for me, I used profanity in front of Mrs. Beale. Your question is, what do I see in this film that people do not? Mm -hmm. There's an entire entire love story behind the film. Devotion to one's cause and to a mother and a daughter. They were very devoted to each other. And despite the conditions, despite, frankly, hardly any real food, I mean, had crackers and rotisserie chicken once in a while, salad. These women endured years of being neglected. And I guess no one owed them a lifestyle that was comfortable. But for Christ's sakes, their relatives had plenty and could have shared more and at least pay for the oil and the oil burning stoves. Well, you know, the Mary, heat. if you don't mind me interrupting for a second, why Please. do you think that the family cut off their relationship with the Beals? I know for certain through conversation, and it wasn't because I was there when it happened, but Mr. Bouvier uh, had given Mrs. Beale an ultimatum. Mrs. Beale had decided she's going to be herself and she once said to me, Jerry, I was born a Bouvier, not a Beale. I mean, I, they came to me and we were married, but my heritage and my mind is so that I will not be uh, harnessed, so to say, by the conventional people I'm married to. So what happens is uh, Mr. Bouvier was very her father too were very um her father was mr Bouvier and mr Bouvier were very one-on-one -on -one. it's a man's world no you're not going to sing this opera nor are you going to influence your daughter to be flirtatious whatever you want to call it creative with costume and wanting to sing and because it was so taboo for a woman to strike up and say no i want to that started the, the tension, I believe, way back before I arrived. Why were they ostracized? Because they were uniquely independent. And the, the Beale family and Bouvier clan didn't particularly understand how a woman could be so ostentatious, so maybe headstrong. Mrs. Beale was the strongest woman I've ever met. And her mind... I mean, she had a very, very sharp mind. I mean, I learned more about history and art and song and dance. Why did they ask? Her, why were they cut off from the family? The family wouldn't have it. Wouldn't have it being well free, a spirited and free. Can you imagine Zachary and Richard? Someone saying to you, Richard, you can't have a show. It's too over the top. Or something. And oh, Zachary, all the time, Jerry. You, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 really beautiful what you're sharing jerry oh. it's uh, it's uh th they are um it's almost like a little uh a little um riot the way that they chose to oh. th their own personal little riot the way they chose to live to, to continue on despite um the expectations uh put upon them by the rest of the the their world it, you're very right. It's exactly what they were about. They had to be themselves. Who doesn't? Who on earth is not going to want to be themselves? And Mrs. Beale was so wise in saying this to me along our years, through our years. You know, no matter who you are and what you stand for, being who you are is a, is a very very difficult to be really who you are. And, uh, and I didn't quite understand it, but years as the years progress, I do understand that you can be one way, a gay man, a straight man, you can be a theatrical person, or you can be a, a juggler in a circus. Any one of these people, cab driver, window washer, it is tough to be who you are. If you listen too far 
to people's opinions of you, then you won't get and trying to people please them, which was out of the question for Mrs. Beale and Edie was devoted to her. It was out of the question for them to be told what to do and what to wear, no less to sing, no less to... Being a housewife was hardly enough for Mrs. Beal. And she, like she said to me, Jerry, I was born a Bouvier. And I just didn't understand that all this time went by. And I, I understood her relatives, like Lee came by and Mrs. Onassis. It just got richer and richer, her heritage. It's true. So um, they were ostracized because they were too off the beaten path for the family. And they decided to, I know the amount of money Mrs. Bill has left. It's no big deal. It was 60 grand to mm. survive on all the years she was uh, divorced, but it really wasn't divorced for the father or the husband. It was sort of a hypocrite in that sense. So he, he strung her along, but just a little bit of money until he passed, left her the some I just said to you to survive on. Now here we got Zachary and Richard. I mean it. You don't have enough money to buy cans of tuna fish, no less to buy bread, and or to pay pay for the garbage collectors to take the garbage, private sanitation away. There was no public sanitation. The electric bill, all the things that we know that need to be paid. No less in East Hampton Town. Oh, holy mackerel! I, that, I don't ever, own anything. I can't. By the way, huh? have I? Have I? Sorry. Have you ever been to East Hampton? By the way, I haven't. I oh. haven't. Oh boy, you could take me. No, <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, you and I are going to go together. Oh, uh, I'd love to. Yes. No, have uh, you, Richard, have you been? Uh, oh, um, many times. I oh, you know, right. friends who have. Uh, you love it, Zach. Uh, so, and I've been to Grey Gardens as well. I've been, uh, I have not been inside the house, but I have been definitely, you know, by the house. I know exactly oh. where it's positioned. I know how close it is. Uh, exactly. Uh, and uh, so I have a real strong sense of that. But I want to go back to something that you just said a moment ago. You talk about how difficult it is for us to be ourselves. Um, and that's true of everybody. I, you know, I, uh, we, from the moment that we, go into the school system as small children. We are taught to conform to what everyone else wants us to be. Uh, that's just life, unfortunately. Um, how were they aware uh, of how they were being perceived once the movie came out? And how did that affect both of them? A very good question. We first saw the movie in the mansion uh, between the main in the staircase, the main staircase, there was one wall that was actually sound, then the film could be seen on that wall. We saw it, Mrs. Mill was pleased, and she said, "And it, this is a masterpiece, and we loved it. I was, I didn't know whether or not I liked it or not. I was sort of, a, never mind how I felt. After the film, we, we had a lot of curiosity seekers come by, Somebody even came to the porch and stole the screen door of the house. Wow. And, you know, we had those types and we had more curious people uh, coming by and looking. There was a few times when I went to town, We Mrs. Onassis gave to the a permission to shop at two stores at Billing Her. So we had groceries. I'd go pick them up. We'd order them, and I'd say, I'm just going to drive my bicycle. What could it be in a bag of groceries? I can manage home. On the grocery line, I remember hearing, oh, that's him. It's a guy. And uh, they were condescending towards me, uh, and, and, and they would say things, cruel things, without mentioning any names out loud, like the cat ladies. And I uh, hope they don't come in here. They must have fleas. And I, they never used their first and last names. But, of course, I knew who, who they were talking about online for the cashier and everything. That was a, It wasn't received very well by, frankly, what I felt were snobby people. Example is the washing machine. I was given a washing machine by my employer. He was selling the mansion. 
and it was exciting because now we can wash our clothes, okay, and make our home a little better. So I put the washing machine on the furniture dolly and began pulling it down Lily Pond Lane, which was taboo. I mean, the looks I got, I only wish I had a camera. <laughs> Bentley is driving by and just opening the window a little to make sure they're seeing what they're seeing. And big shot cars and all this stuff. Uh, it was in the paper. It was like the scandal of the year that peon me was pulling a washing machine down a lily pond lane and, and they were very condescending oh big deal i have i've been insulted in the best corner of new york city i'm used to <laughs> driving a taxi you hear it all so it didn't it didn't bother me then it didn't bother me later but it didn't hurt my feelings that mrs bill and edie were being uh, put down like that and even up to the raids first day. Um, but the film, I'm trying to stay on a track. And after the film, and Edie went to Lincoln Center, Edie had changed. She had a little touch of freedom, and she knew it. And I could feel and tell that she no longer was that happy about being home because she wanted to be out. She got a lot of attention, deservingly so. In Lincoln Center, she had a bouquet of flowers. And up in the rafters where she was, balcony, she threw the roses onto the audience who were really excited to see her. Some received her film, Mrs. Beale's film, uh, in a good light, creative light, and applauded their tenacity. And then the other people who wanted just to, well, to dog them, had a field day, and they still, well, sadly enough, you know, it, it open minds, you know, it's, they're like parachutes. Oh, people's minds only operate when they're opened, and these people would put them down to the point, fellas, I just am baffled at how cruel they could be still, but how, how also accommodating, and well, I, I applaud their kindness towards Mrs. Pioni. No one would understand better than I the conditions that we all had to endure and maintain some type of happiness and, and manage to be fulfilled each day with one, food and comfort, which was always fleeting, um, and, well, understanding, you know. There's a lot to great gardens that people do not see. They see it again, the 90 film, in the film. I hope that answered your question. Uh, absolutely. Jer Zachary, do you have any questions? No, no it's just, uh, well, I'm sure I do, but it, it, it and pardon me because I am I'm coming, my, my toe is just getting stuck into this world, okay. Jerry. All right. I want to ask but, you, um, you know, and then, you know, and I'll, and I'll get back to your story in a moment, Jerry. No, no. Um, how did the role come about for you, Zachary? Did they, did you have to audition? <laughs> Or they know your work, obviously. Did they ask if you wanted to do this role? No, no. I, I, uh, I had to send in tape remotely. Um, the the company gets an opportunity to uh, audition for all the shows, and and then when they can't uh, find someone within the company, they they reach outside the company, which is great because that's how we grow. Well, uh, but uh, but w what I wanted to say, uh, and and. Again, with the guard up that uh, uh, I, I am just um, just seeing into this, but it, it sounds like people were l looking at th this film, which uh, it sounds like some of the commentary is that like they were they were living in an inhumane way. But the, the, then you have people showing up to screen steal screen doors, mm -hmm. yes. who are completely dehumanizing them. Oh. Um, in the process, uh, so it, it's it's such a it, it's such a terrible. It's like the it's like the comments section come to life on on these people. It's it sounds yeah. well, terrible, so Jerry. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, don't be sorry. You're honest, and it's true. It's Thank true. Well, I've I've said in the uh, in both of our previous times on the show that these were two very real people. They were three very real people. 
Uh, and sometimes when you see someone on the screen, uh, you know, I had the good fortune of being good friends with Carol Channing. And the real Carol Channing that I saw, you know, behind, you know, at mm -hmm. home and everything, um, when she let her hair down, she spoke in a deeper voice than we normally saw on stage and everything. But people think that when someone, and this is not true of just these, but any artist that is on the screen and reaches iconic status, as you all have, that there's something, uh, it, it's like open season. For, to be able to say and do anything that it's going to bounce off like Teflon. Um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, Jerry, and I'm glad that we've got a third chance to do this because I've got so oh, many questions. Thank you for being here. Um, but uh, you, um, I want to, uh, we know in the book about your relationship with your, uh, with both of your parents. Um, yes. Did they have a relationship at all uh, deeply with the Beals? Oh, well, honest to God, uh, I had run away. You may not know that, but I did. My father was very uh, heavy-handed. He didn't prefer my choice of people, uh, my sexual desire, and I didn't hide from him. I didn't care, but I ran from him because he was very old-fashioned, I guess, but I didn't care to be beat because of my uh, sexual preferences, so I ran. My mother... It's the complete opposite. My mom is a real gentle human being, as kind as you can see anyone being. And I just love her still so much because she taught me fortitude and to be kind and, and everything I love about being alive. They came out to the mansion several times. Word led to this person to that. They knew that I was living in East Hampton and working uh, for Lily on uh, Lily Pond Lane, and well, they knew and lived in Mrs. Beale's mansion. So they came by one day unexpectedly, and my mother would come to the front door and all we'll sit near, you know, stand on the porch, and uh, the door would be opened, and Edie would be talking to my father, and then they'd go in the back of the mansion. And my father was flirtatious with Edie, and yeah. he had also alopecia, so he was like the man from Brooklyn, and always doing his thing, like with women. But my mother, God almighty bless her, she was at the front porch, and she was to go, Jerry, what are you doing with these two women? You're going to wind them just like them. Please come home. And I would hold, hold on to the banister, on the second floor, I'm not kidding, because I would, I'd sit down on the stairs because I was unsure of what to do. And I was tearing up and Mrs. Beale was over there sitting on the porch. She sat in a little wooden chair on that floor. And she was, believe it or not, I think she was a little jealous of my feelings for my own mother. And I'll tell you about that later. But uh, Mrs. Beale saw my upset, I was upset. My mother was bellowing for me to come out of the mansion, which I couldn't do. Because if I had my father, all the strength, he was like a tree, would have picked me up and put me in the car. And uh, I would have been back in that car. I don't know what would have happened. I would have left anyway again. But I couldn't leave Mrs. Bill and Edie, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, the relationship with, Ms. with Edie, my father... This may not make any sense to modern man, but this is in the kitchen. There was the uh, perfection wood burning, coal burning stove. And next to the stove was a copper water tank for heating water and holding it. So when it worked, and that was a long time before, the house would have hot water. So my father's there. And this is the truth. I'm not embarrassed by it. To say he did this, not me. He asked Edie if he could take the copper water tank and, and take it parts to sell for junk, metal. You know, that was the thing they did in the Depression to have an extra dollar to sell brass and copper and lead. And he, he didn't ask her. And uh, I found that a little bit offensive because Edie didn't know right from wrong or hot from cold. And uh, she didn't know how to answer that, and I'm glad she didn't answer that. But 
he was also flirtatious with Edie, and he would Edie would mention more than once about the family hand always reaching for me to come home. I never did. I only went to my brother's wedding that time during my living in Great Gardens. You know, um, that was the relationship my parents had with the Beals. My mother would always say to me later, right up to the end of a beautiful life, she'd say, oh, you remember the Beatles? I said, Ma, it's the Beals, not the Beatles. <laughs> okay. Okay. From Brooklyn, okay? And she'd always refer to Mrs. Beale and Edie as the Beatles. So that was, you know, when they're stubborn, they're stubborn. They wouldn't change. So um, my aunt, her sister, actually, I, I got the tickets. We went to the theater to see the, to see the musical. And my aunt was there. You know what she did when Jerry came out, Zach? When he came out playing and the song was playing, my aunt said, Oh, he's been my he's my nephew. And, and she was she got loud in the right in the audience. And I said, Aunt Virginia, they're not here to hear that. They don't want to know that. And sit down and pack theater. She's proud and happy and from Brooklyn. Oh, that's supposed to be my nephew, Jerry. He's he's right here. Uh so that was she was a character. I loved her. Anyway. So Jerry, I know that you were invited to the first reading of the Guggenheim and that you uh, followed through with everything. Um, and of course, uh, as they were creating the musical, they wanted to replicate what all of us saw on screen. Did you have any input at all into what they were doing with your character? Um, well, they, when they asked me, yes, I did respond to the question um, well I even responded to Matt's hair wearing a wig and yeah, no big deal but I said it really doesn't look like me then <laughs> it, it, it is a little bit dark it was too light so I, I interviewed I was input what I could when they asked and about the stage and the setting there was a few times that I was asked, yeah. oh, that's me when I was young. Ah, yes. I did, Jerry. <laughs> so they, <laughs> they asked me questions about the interior, what was going on. They even considered having this cat urine in the audience spread about to authenticate the interior of the mansion. I'm glad they passed on that. <laughs> they did. They did pass. Yeah, I, I didn't think that would work because people might not like that. So, yeah, they asked me several questions, not about clothing, because I didn't know much about that. But, excuse me, the distance between the two beds, the hot plate, which was really a sterno, but not electric. They didn't want, they couldn't use fire in the theater, so they had to use the hot plate, but it wasn't even plugged in. The point is, there were certain precautions necessary to safeguard the audience. Mary, if you can talk about that for a moment, because, I mean, we do have this image of them, you know, with a hot plate and everything in the show. Um, and Zachary, I'm sure you know, Jerry likes my corn. Uh, but uh, you talked about this in the previous show about uh, the fact that it was Cerno and the fact that her bed actually caught on fire once. Yes. We there. I, I was... Zach, by the way, I applaud you. You're one good-looking young guy. <laughs> and, and I'm so proud to be you working, performing <laughs> as me. I'm thrilled. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an honor. No, it is for me. You're great looking and you speak well. And, well, you can speak good English. So what else did you offer? <laughs> I've got a question uh, from Robert Hutchinson. Robert, thank you for watching. Oh, Robert. Uh, the question is, will a play or musical ever be made in your life? Will a musical be made in, yes. in my life? Your life. This musical has already been made. <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's a lot more to your life than what we see in Grey Gardens, Jerry. Well, uh, I would... I don't know how on earth they would perform a musical in my life, for about my life, but it has been varied, and I have traveled the world. I've had experiences. 
I could only think of and sometimes pray for. I always wanted to visit the pyramids, and I was found confounded to be in Italy. Excuse me, I have sinuses. That's okay. Um, I would be honored, of course. Who wouldn't be? But I think it would scare a lot of people. <laughs> Jerry, um, the, uh, the documentary you. came out in 1975. Yes, excuse me. I had to do that. I'm so yeah, sorry. That's okay. Uh, the to... musical came out in 1975. Does it still surprise you that this uh, story resonates so deeply with people this many years later? It's, it certainly does, Richard. It, I get emails from every corner of the world. In Japan, they send me, I can't read Japanese, and but they send them and I have a friend decipher them. And it's all complimentary. They're very gentle people, creative, no doubt. Well, um, does it does it surprise me? Oh, yes, it does. I did. Mrs. Beale once said to me, "Jerry, in your lifetime, our friendship is going to be of interest to many people." Uh, a raccoon just began falling out of the library wall ceiling and I, she said that to me and i just didn't know what to say i said oh that'd be great so let's get upstairs because the raccoon is now on the floor in the library she said that to me god bless her she and then once i said to mrs beal when we first began our friendship and I, I said mrs beal you are very interesting this house is a very interesting someone you know Someone should come along and write a book or make a film or do something uh, based on all that's around here. I see everything. This is Bill chuckled. I didn't know anything about theater. I didn't know they were related to who. But I'll tell you, they, I, it was never a dull moment in Grey Gardens. It was always entertaining and quite interesting all the time. Do you want me to answer you about the fire issue? Yes, please. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Don't be sorry, please. I went out working on the front porch, trimming back some brush, and I went upstairs that about 1 o'clock to, to sit down, maybe find some bread or something to eat. So I went up to the main bed. We called it the center bedroom. And I'm sitting there. Before I got there, Mrs. Beale had the sterno lit and she was making tea, you know, hot tea. And then Mrs. Beale decided to end cook, heating the tea water and put the sterno lid back on the sterno. And while she's fumbling with it, she knocks the entire thing over, the sterno, the tea, and the fire from the sterno went on the mattress under the contraption that holds it above the ground, you know, and it just, the fire was blue and it went that way and that way and under newspapers and tissue boxes. And I'm sitting, I'm now standing in disbelief and I just instinctively kept put out the fire with papers, newspapers. And uh, Edie's over there, I don't know what land she just went to, but she's over there fiddling with her shoes. And I said to Mrs. Beale, I mean, she was not present, if you know what I mean, about the fire. Edie wasn't. So I said to Mrs. Beale very politely, because I had the most respect, I said, Mrs. Beale, when you cook, promise to let me know so I can dine with you, so I can come upstairs. Just call me and let me know you can light the fire at the sterno, because I'd rather eat with you than not. And she agreed, and it was fine. That's how other meals were put together, and it was safer, much safer. And that's how the corn on the cob day occurred. Because she was making corn on the cob, I was a few minutes late, she already begun, and the flame was already heating the water. But I went up there knowing the fire flame was cooking the water, and uh, that's how the <laughs> corn on the cob, can you believe it? And Scott, and Michael took that little segment, Zach, that moment of the film, and turned it into a most tender song that I, I'm honored. I mean, when I heard them singing that song, I could listen to that a lot and still love it. 
You know, I, I can't sing, but you can sing. Well, that just up some people in this business, as Zachary knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Just out loud and proud. That's all I ask. Um, wow. So I want to ask about uh, the filming itself for the documentary. Um, when you're doing a documentary, uh, some you know, it, as often is the case, it takes on a life of its own. Did the film turn out the way that they had originally envisioned that it would, or did it take on a life of its own? And what surprised you the most when you actually saw the film for the first time? Good question. The first time I saw the film is not the film you see now. It was interesting in this way. You know the Popeye cartoons, remember? And the curtain would close be in another scene, and Popeye and Olive Oil were there doing whatever, and the scene would end in another. The curtain, the cartoon curtain would once again close, and it would be another scene from Popeye the Sailor Man. That was what the original film looked like. It would be like, okay, Scene one, the argument. Scene two, the fire. Scene three, the, the cleanup. Every scene had a curtain closed and then open to another scene. And before that second or third scene, it was titled like, you know, the cleanup, the argument, the sunroom. And it was portion, portioned in this way. When I have seen that, and I was thrilled, uh, I thought it was a great film. and Not that I felt good about Edie's response to my presence in the attic, but never mind, Edie, Edie was Edie. I, I did ask her after I saw that film first time, I said, you know, Edie, that sort of hurt my feelings that you thought I was being dishonest with you with the books in the library. And then Edie the just turned to me and said, do you think this cost this matches my uh, my? Yeah. I said, yeah, I think it matches beautifully. She just disregarded my feelings, and it was not important to answer the question I asked her because he she did hurt my feelings. But he said, no, do you think this matches this? And how will it look at high heels? I, I just gave up. So that was that. The well, film yeah. that you see now is also edited further, you know? Zach, I sure hope I'm not monopolizing this conversation. You're, you're the star here, Jerry. We're, we're, um, we're oh, both I mean, basking in this, uh, uh, these stories. So Well, I don't want to bore you. No, no, you're, you're not boring I me. I hope I'm not coming across that way. These well, are fascinating stories. Well, uh, I just want you to know how I appreciate Richard, I love. Now I'm getting closer to you, Zachary, and I'm honored that you're going to do this for uh, my memory's sake. Yeah. Something like that, you know. I don't want to. Be, I am monopolizing this conversation, but well, I'm excited, well, you know. As uh, as Zachary just said, and Zachary wanted this opportunity, and I'm glad that you reached out for this, Zachary. Um, Robert Hutchison has a question that I was. Uh, going oh, to get he's from to Canada. Hi, Robert. He wanted to know if you ever saw Lady, uh, Little Edie's cabaret show. No, I did not. I went afterwards after the show was ending one night. I, I Frankly, I was in a bathhouse when that New Year's Eve weekend was there. You know, I, I had no interest in seeing Edie dance around again. I wanted to go have fun. And I did. So, <laughs> Good um, for you. The city was uh, unvarnished then and not sterilized as it is today. So that's that. I don't want to get started on history of New York City because I get arrested. <laughs> anyway, um, here's what I did. I knew she was right around the block on West 13th Street. And I went down there to see the end. Of, I thought the show was still going on. It wasn't. But the most remarkable event, Mrs. Onassis and her sister Lee were at the end table, a little table, and she they had deli had delivered they had delivered a big box of roses, wood box, and it had had a little note on it that evidently someone stole from the box being delivered. 
and it was all roses. It was such a classy thing. A box of roses from Mrs. Arnassus and her sister Lee. And Edie, I didn't see because she was swallowed by the audience over there. But from I'll be honest about everything. Um, the audience sort of played silly with her. Like she, uh, well, they they weren't kind in the little diggy the digs. And they didn't. They weren't fair. They were they were exploiting Edie. I didn't like it. You know, folks, it wasn't the greatest talent, but she was a sincere talent. And no, she wasn't uh, Christine Ebersol for sure, but she did her best and tried her best. So that hurt, disappointed me. I didn't see much more of the show, only the end of the last show when Mrs. Onassis showed up with the box. Of when was the last time that you saw little Edie? I know that she moved to Florida and right. before she uh, passed away. Uh, right. When was the last time that you saw her? Well, wow, that's a very sentimental moment. I'm in my taxi cab. I'm driving west on East 61st Street towards Fifth Avenue. And uh, the light's red. It's drizzling. It's a November evening. And traffic is merciless, so I have a customer in back seat. She's not complaining, but uh, the light, it was traffic, it was slow. And we're at the corner where the Pia Hotel is, and there's over over the Pia Hotel's entranceway is a canopy with, you know, those heating heaters uh -huh. that you stand on there and they heat up the area? That They were on, you can see them on, they're always on in the winter. And... Uh, I had my window open a little because it was steaming in the Kano's condensation. And I looked to my left and my customer says, who is that? And there under the heater on the sidewalk is dear Edie Beale. She's wearing what looks like a, a gold a scarab, like a Egyptian pharaoh might wear, a very obviously richly decorated cobra or snake of some kind wrapped around only her skull, no hat. It was uniquely, definitely Edie. And I looked up and Edie and I made eye contact and she was very gentle and smiled, it was lovely. And I nodded and my customer said, who's that again? I said, I said that's Edie Beale. That was the last time we saw each other. Wow. And it was like in traffic, as I said. <laughs> we didn't see each other for the last time. It was most mo a moving moment because I, of course, wanted to get out and hold her and ask her everything and more. But I couldn't. I was working. And she acknowledged me through her eyes, and I was mine. That was the last time. You know, it was also, you know, very touching to me to see her. She was at the, she was staying at the Pierre Hotel, which she often frequented when she was a younger woman. You know, yeah. you, no doubt when you have seen Edie in public. Well, that's the finest I ever saw her looking in Manhattan. It was I know exactly. I know everything about her moves and her visions and so, everything. So I said, yeah, that's Edie Beale. <laughs> it was. Uh, Life. She and Mrs. Beale changed my life for the good. Well, the and their lives. So God bless uh -huh. you for that. Um, we're going to run out of time as we normally do on these shows. Uh, but Zachary, I want to ask you um, any question that you want to ask Jerry that mm -hmm. reading between the lines of your script, something that's not there that you would like to ask him. Jerry, your life has better writers than most of our lives. Um, writers? I cannot, I cannot believe uh, th just the last moment that you shared with us was so touching. Um, mm. It's, it's, it's like your, your, your life is being written by, by someone who deserves awards, and the rest of us are scraping oh, by with, uh, you know, community plots or something. Oh. But uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I. I, I don't have a question for you really right now, Jerry. I just want to 
um, thank you for for taking the time to uh, to chat with me today. Zach, my hope and my hope for meeting you and seeing you talk to you is to applaud your efforts here. And also, I'm very honored that you're playing me over in California, deservingly so. Look how good looking he is. I mean, come on. And that's an honor in itself. And Thank you. Be, yeah, you're welcome, man. And uh, I I'm touched. I only want the best for you, Zach. I want you to be happy and successful. And Rich is already happy and successful. Now it's your turn. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm yes. going to give my closing remarks, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, Zachary. And then, Jerry, you'll have the final word today uh, oh. again. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, as I've said in the previous show, uh, this is for one night only. Uh, with the Musical Theater Guild in LA. All the details will be on my YouTube channel. Uh, I realize that a lot of my viewers are scattered all over the country, and I appreciate that. Uh, but if you have a friend in LA, uh, you could do them all a favor by treating them to the show, if you're able to do so. Um, support the theater, even if you're not able to buy a ticket for someone. Any donation that you could make, because they do incredible works, and they bring theater to life again that we don't necessarily get a chance to see. I know that they just recently did Brigadoon and this closes out this season, uh, but uh, there are other seasons. They're going to be moving to another space. Uh, you're at the Alex Theater. Am I correct, Zachary? That's correct in Glendale. Yep. And uh, they'll be moving on. Uh, so keep up to date with what they're doing uh, and uh, whether it's there uh, or anywhere, support live theater. There's nothing like being in the audience with other people and celebrating everything together that we see on stage. Uh, I end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, I want to dedicate this show today to Howard Bragman. Uh, some of you may not know who Howard Bragman was, uh, but he was a publicist. And he passed away this weekend on my birthday, actually, oh. on Saturday night. Uh, we only met in passing once, uh, but every time I reached out to him, he responded. Uh, even if it was to say, I'm sorry, I don't have the time or I, I'm busy or whatever, I considered him almost a mentor. He has a wonderful book uh, called Where Are My 15 Minutes? Um, and he passed away at the age of 68 from leukemia. Oh, okay. uh, and it's another reminder of how precious our lives are. So it's important that we reach out and we make a phone call to those people that matter. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let these people know how they matter in our lives. That's my wish. That's my request that I ask of each of you. As a dear friend of mine says, we're all in the same storm. We're in different sized boats. I don't care if you're in a yacht or a canoe or a raft, or even if you're push, uh, pushing uh, a tugboat upstream, just make sure that when this happens, that you have a skipper by your side. Oh, I love you. And with that, I'm gonna leave the screen and Zachary, it's all yours. And when you turn it over to Jerry, uh, Jerry, you'll finish the show. And thank you all for being here today. Zachary, it's all yours. I love that analogy, Richard. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I just want to make sure everybody knows I, I'm I'm the heel who was running late today. Uh, oh. So, uh, Richard, thank you for um, uh, and Glenn Rosenblum, thank you for for putting us together today, so that I could get a chance to meet Jerry. Uh, Jerry, you are have lived a, just a huge life, a tremendous life. Thank you for sharing some stories with me today. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been really helpful getting to know you. And uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know oh, you a little geez. bit today. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll you know, do my best to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to honor you um, on the 27th. Wow. Thank you, Zach. Oh, and Richard. Zach, do me a favor and send my best regards to Matt Cavanaugh. Um, I haven't seen or heard from him in, I don't know, maybe 10 years, but my best to him is wife, Jenny, okay? And Richard, thank you for this show. Zach, I am, I guess honored isn't really the word, 
It's a magical time for me, and you're playing me? God help you. I'm just glad someone is. I'm not playing me. I am me. But you're really cool. I love that. I also, for the cast of this show, the reading, Glenn and everyone, and the producer, there's so many names. I can hardly remember mine. But the point is, all of you, dear people, through your efforts, I'll say this to the day I kicked the bucket, your efforts have taken Mrs. Beale and Dairy Story legacy, the very venue they sought to the, a real theater. They never had, Edie had her show, yes, but Mrs. Beale never really had the opportunity to be on the stage, and she would have been a beautiful performance, and I know that. And Edie, with any of these opportunities, well, they didn't happen for the ladies, and uh, you're bringing it all to fruition, and I'm honored to be alive. I'm glad, because now my life is full circle, and, uh, oh, Richard, you and I are born on the same month. I'm 25 of January, and you are, well, obviously February, which must make you an Aquarius. Now, that's a you're poor bastard. You're like me. You're very free. I'm sorry to use that terminology, but uh, you're a wonderful dude, very happy with friends, and I'll always be your friend. And pardon my language, I am from Brooklyn. Thank you all so very much. I mean that, you know. Um, have a nice show and enjoy. Oh, St. Valentine's Day. Try to behave yourselves, okay? And thank you. And, and good night, everybody. Bye.